Hi, my name is Jacques Dion. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor uh, Christoph Grissenauer. He is Director of Vascular and Endovascular Neurosurgery at the Geisinger Clinic, and also an Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. Um, by the way, he's an extremely prolific author. He, he's just about to hit the 300 uh, published peer-reviewed paper mark. Uh, today, uh, Christoph is going to be discussing uh, one of his publications from last year, a comparison of pipeline embolization device and flow redirection and aluminal device flow diverters for internal carotid artery aneurysms, a propensity score matched cohort study. In summary, this is a paper that uh, attempted to um, have an apples to apples comparison between the pipeline device and the FREB device. In, in essence, um, Dr. Grissenauer uh, extracted the experience from two neurovascular centers in the United States and uh, compared that cohort of patients to the European uh, FRED uh, experience um, as uh, described in the UFRED paper. From these patient populations, they extracted uh, a matched group of patients. So, uh, Dr. Grissenauer, uh, please uh, go ahead. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dion. Thank you very much for the introduction. And also thank you to the team at Microvention to give me the opportunity to present our work. Uh, I specifically do not have any disclosures related to this talk. As an introduction, we are very well familiar with the tremendous uh, benefit and outcome we have seen with the advent of flow diversion. Um, it, we're practicing in a uh, time where there's no doubt that flow diversion is the optimal treatment for a lot of cerebral aneurysms. So this technology is very well established. You can see on these pictures of these large cavernous aneurysms that the results are just really remarkable. Um, but what we don't really know is how are those results going to uh, compare when more flow diverters become available on the market? Um, in the United States, we currently have three approved uh, flow diverters. In other parts of the world, there's more than uh, those three available. And we really have no studies that directly compare two uh, different flow diverters in a well-structured uh, and uh, well-designed well uh, clinical setting. So what this study was meant to do was it was meant to compare the pipeline embolization device, um, which was approved in Europe in 2009 and then later approved in 2011, which is a single layer flow diverter with uh, 48 uh, strands uh, braided mesh to the FRED um, dual layer flow directional and aluminal device uh, that uh, is made by Microvention. The unique feature about this device is that it has two layers, an inner flow diverting um, component that has between 33 and 44 percent metal surface coverage and, and is made up of 48 wires, and then also an outer scaffold that provides higher radial force is made out of 16 wires. And this device has been approved in Europe for quite a while. It was first approved in 2013 and recently had, has gotten FDA approval earlier this year. So what we tried to accomplish in this paper that was uh, published in 2018 was we wanted to compare two flow diverters like it hadn't been done in the literature before. And we took our experience with our own patients, both from uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, where I did my endovascular fellowship, and Geisinger, two centers here in the Northeast and the United States, and we compared uh, our experience to what was reported in the FRED registry. Uh, for those not familiar with, with the FRED or UFRED registry, this was a large prospective registry of FRED cases performed all over Europe. Uh, this is the original paper in AJNR, uh, published also around uh, 2018, that um, presented the outcome of this study with over 500 aneurysms treated with the FRED device. But as I said, this is, to my knowledge, the first study that actually compared two different flow diverters. And it was published in Neurosurgery 
2019. You can see the list of authors here. I want to acknowledge all the co-authors and um, give a shout out, especially to Monika Killer Oberpfalzer, who has helped us tremendously with pulling off this research. What you can see here is the two baseline characteristics of the two cohorts, basically. We had 221 threat uh, pipeline cases and compared them to 282 uh, threat cases. And uh, what you can see here that the two cohorts really had significant difference in terms of the age at the time of the treatment, um, just basic demographics, age, gender, aneurysm morphology, aneurysm size, um, previously treated aneurysms. So to like compare those two cohorts without any sort of matching would not really be a comparison of apples to apples, as Dr. Dion said. It's that's they're more like a comparison of apples to oranges. So what we did is we used a statistical technique called uh, propensity score matching. And the idea behind the technique is you create patient pairs that are as sim similar as possible. Um, to make this comparison more equitable, we excluded any subarachnoid hemorrhage case. Um, we propensity score matched for the age of the patient, the um, gender, for aneurysm size, aneurysm location, number of devices used, very important, uh, and also whether adjunctive coiling was used. And what you can see here is that after matching, we arrived at 55 aneurysms in each cohort. Uh, the aneurysms were very similar in size, you know, around six, seven, aneur seven millimeters, which is typical for a lot of anterior circulation, internal carotid artery aneurysms that are currently being treated uh, with flow diverters in, in real practice. Um, the number of flow diverters used was very different, for example, from what was used in PUFFs. Uh, the vast majority of procedures were performed with either one or at the most two uh, flow diverters. Um, what was really strikingly similar and strikingly impressive is that the complete occlusion rate between pipeline and thread was really identical to the percentage point. And this is remarkable if you think about the way the study was designed. We really compared North American pipeline cases to European thread cases, um, really excluding any kind of selection bias in some ways because really those two continents practice just the way they would practice but without any um, external influence from uh, you know the study um, team itself. Um, in terms of clinical outcome again the results were very very similar. There was a small advantage for um, good functional outcome at last follow-up for thread but um, you know just minor difference and then also in complications, there was no significant difference between the two devices. The complication rate was slightly higher for thread and pipeline, but we included both symptomatic and asymptomatic complications here in this uh, analysis. So this may also be due to some uh, uh, center variation in terms of how patients were imaged um, after their flow diversion procedures and some asymptomatic thromboembolic kits may have been picked up. But again, no major, major differences in the numbers here as well. So I think in conclusion, um, what we can say is that even though we are really having two completely different devices in terms of their design, um, that we're comparing the outcomes between both angiographic and functional um, dimensions were really strikingly similar. And this is across completely different patient cohorts across two different continents. Um, there was a slightly higher rate of um, near complete occlusion with uh, thread that certainly warrants uh, some additional investigation. And really both devices have equally um, favorable safety profiles um, in, in this study. So again, I wanna thank you, the team at Microvention and everybody involved in, in making the study possible for the opportunity to quickly review our results here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Grissenauer. That was uh, fantastic. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one, could you expand on the propensity matching process itself 
and how do you think that should be used in the future for other devices? Sure. Uh, so we, we had two cohorts of patients. One was the pipeline cohort, the other one was the thread cohort. And as I showed on one of the slides, right out of the gate, they differed significantly. So the intent was to match each pipeline and each thread case uh, for a number of characteristics to make them as similar as possible, but at the same time um, allow some variation to where we could match enough patients overall that we could make some sort of statistical analysis and draw conclusions. So we matched for important factors. Um, as I said, we excluded any subarachnoid hemorrhage cases because they obviously introduce a lot of bias, but then we matched for just age, sex of the patient, specifically aneurysm size and location, the number of devices used, and also adjunctive coiling, which are all important characteristics of flow diversion procedures. Um, and doing so, we were able to match 55 pairs that then allowed us to really dive into uh, kind of the nitty-gritty outcome characteristics in terms of clinical outcome and also angiographic outcome. Uh, so we, we think that that was a, a fine balance between, um, you know, not undermatching, but also not overmatching to have enough patients to draw some, some conclusions. In terms of how this technology or this statistical approach can be used in our field, uh, I think we see more and more um, papers, at least in the neuroendovascular and neurosurgical literature, uh, looking at propensity score matching. and um, it's very unlikely that we're going to have uh, randomized studies comparing different devices for endovascular um, technologies. At least so far, we haven't had that. And I think that this technique really lends itself to study a whole number of um, endovascular devices in maybe catheters for strokes, stent retrievers, coils, stents. Um, Theoretically, any device uh, by any manufacturer could be compared using a similar approach uh, as we used for, for this flow diversion study. Thank you. I have uh, one other question for you. What do you think the impact of data like this would or will be on, on your practice, but also on the practice of, of other physicians in the country or around the world? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. I think that really when we work on papers like this, the real purpose is to provide some data that um, clinicians can use in, um, you know, making the best decision for their patients. And, um, you know, my endovascular experience is, is, is still limited. I've been in practice for around four years now after fellowship. And um, during my fellowship and in the time after uh, the only device really approved for the majority of that time was the pipeline device. So um, that's the all the personal experience I had. And then we did this kind of research and we did this research in a perfectly unbiased way because um, all the investigators really either contributed FRED or contributed pipeline, but nobody really contributed both. And I think it's so important to highlight that these were similar time frames, but these were different practitioners performing at different continents. So really there was very little um, cross talk between uh, all the, you know, all the investigators here, which I think should strengthen the finding of the study, really that these devices seem to be very comparable across so many factors that, you know, we can never control for, such, just the, such as, you know, patient characteristics across different geographic uh, locations. So how has this influenced my own practice? Well, um, personally, um, when the FRED device was approved earlier this year, uh, I was very keen on using it. It, um, you know, the knowing the data that we had, you know, produced our from our own research reassured me that um, very likely this device was was going to work well. And you know, there is certain advantages and disadvantages to probably all flow diverters, but in the grand scheme of things. It was very reassuring to see that uh, in a study like this, there were no gross differences between a flow diverter that had been established in, on this continent and in this country for close to 10 years and a new flow diverter coming to the market. 
So, you know, using those data have helped me uh, in many ways um, justifying, uh, you know, using a new flow diverter and, and just really finding the unique um, features that each of those devices have to, um, you know, optimally treat treat the patients. Thank you, Christoph. Well, this concludes our session. I'd like to thank you for your time and your expertise. Thank you very much again for the invitation.